Father, thank you for this time of worship, your presence here. Now we ask that as the word of God is open, Lord, that our hearts and our minds, Lord, will be open as well. That Holy Spirit, you would teach us, that you would lead us, guide us, provide everything we need from your word, the light of it, the, the nourishment that comes from it, the challenge and the, the sharpening that comes from it, Lord, that you would awaken us and put within us a, a, the fire of your word, Lord, that you would stir us up according to your word, that through your word, the hammer of God would come and break up our fallow ground and our hard hearts, that, Lord, where we are broken or wounded and needing encouragement, I pray that the word of God would come like a soothing salve, Lord, and just bring healing to those areas within our body, soul, or spirit that need the, the healing that comes from your word, Lord. Most importantly, Jesus, the word living, I pray you would reveal yourself through the scripture to each person here as their Lord and Savior, that, Lord, their lives would, would have an encounter with you through the proclamation and the presence of the Holy Spirit here, and that they would grow in their faith or be born anew from above or strengthen, Lord, in their giftings. Whatever is needed for them this morning, bless them because the word of God was opened and heard and read and sung and taught, believed and obeyed, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we move through John, you may wonder why we're in John. I just want to give a little overview of a little bit of understanding of something. Uh, when we went through COVID, one of the things that came through the COVID time was it was a pretty significant shaking of both of individuals, of hearts, families, jobs, culture. We went through a pretty dramatic in different ways for different people shaking. A lot of that shaking revealed that maybe our foundations weren't as 
uh, as strong in Christ and the truth of Scripture as maybe we thought. We saw a lot of death. We saw a lot of suicide. We saw a lot of mental health breakdown. We saw a lot of cultural uh, antagonism and, and anger. And we saw relationships splinter. We saw political divides uh, open up in real clear ways. We saw the advance of politics maybe exalted in a way in our culture that has been kind of not as prevalent as in the past. I mean, I think we can make a case that politics have been pretty front and burner for American people for a long time, but it was extra evident that we were a people of different colors, red and blue and purple and everything in between, and that was very evident. That shaking for me as a pastor was like, man, you know, I see a lot of people that seem to be putting their faith and their hope and their joy and their security in things that are being shaken and not in Christ in the way that I maybe as a pastor would hope uh, tough times would have revealed. So as a part of that kind of assessment, like, wow, a storm came through. We saw where the lawn chairs disappeared and what stuff broke and what stuff still stood, what marriages made it, which ones didn't, all kinds of things, what people stayed in their jobs. People came to all kinds of conclusions and went all kinds of different directions. In the aftermath of that, I was like, well, I need to maybe return to some fundamentals. So we, we went through the catechism as, as kind of expressed to the Westminster Historic Document of Confession and, and Catechesis, which is a process of biblical foundations in the Christian faith, a biblical statement, an idea, and then what we believe about that. We went through that for 53 a year of that in teaching. Then after that, kind of after readdressing kind of like the basics of our faith, I wanted to kind of reflect on how our faith fits within the story of God. Remind us once again of God's great saving work, what he's doing in the earth, why all the stories in the Bible are there to show us that God's been with his people through all kinds of challenges, sufferings, bad kings, good kings, faithfulness, disobedience, and show that in the story of the word of God from beginning to end, it's pretty dramatic, but God's been with his people through all of those times and that we can trust in him. And so kind of reminded ourselves about the story of scripture. So we did that for a, a, a year, I think, or so. After that, I wanted to... Uh, do the Gospel of John. One of the reasons I wanted to do the Gospel of John is John gives us a unique account of the life of Jesus in light of how the Gospel of Jesus and the coming of God's kingdom answers a lot of the failures and problems and misaligned hopes of God's people throughout Scripture. Jesus was not the expected Messiah to the people. He was crucified in part because he did not fulfill the people's idea of what a Messiah would be. So as we look through our faith, our, the story of God, where Jesus is taking the people of God was profoundly different than where God's people had been and organized themselves and thought of themselves throughout Scripture. And Jesus got in a lot of conflict with people in the Gospels because their vision of what the Messiah should be in some ways matched Jesus, in other ways was extremely counter to their understanding and expectations of what the king Messiah would look like. And John opens that up to us in some ways that none of the other synoptic gospel writers do as, as similar. So John in chapter 10, we just came off of chapter 9 where he heals a blind, a blind man on the Sabbath. <clears throat> that Sabbath miracle and lots of other Sabbath miracles produced a lot of anger in the Pharisees, particularly. Doing something on the Sabbath was a view that was rooted not only in the Mosaic law and, and the, the teachings of the law, it was also rooted in the understanding of, of just the identity of God's people and what they do of, in worship. The community worship was on the Sabbath. 
Everything about the synagogue, the temple, the sacrifices, the, the singing, everything was surrounded around this day of rest where God alone gets, gets all the glory. Historically speaking, the people of God in Israel at that time, in, in Judea and Galilee and you know, Jerusalem, had been through a lot of historical events in the last 200 years particularly that positioned the people of God to be looking for a certain type of Messiah at this moment. A lot of the, the tragedies for the people of God prior to the time of Jesus rooted around the desecration of the temple, the, the advancement of God's enemies in power over the people of God, and particularly the rise of a not too distant past warrior king, Judas Maccabee, who had defeated God's enemies, reunited Israel, cleansed the temple, and, and rose to power with his family, and brought dignity and honor to the people of God before the Romans came in and did the whole story over again. So they, their hopes of a, of a Messiah figure had just been realized in some ways and then dashed. Then Jesus comes on the scene and all of his miracles and power and his teaching starts resurrecting all this hope that the Messiah might be here now and that the failures of that great revolution of the Maccabees might be revived and this time Rome is going to fall and we're going to have a bringing back of all the people of God, cleansing the temple, reuniting the people under God's law, and, and, and rise once again to be an independent people, blessed by God and ruling in the nations. Jesus did not conform to that vision in the way a lot of the leaders and various people wanted and we see in the Gospel of John, as we're moving to, through chapters, that the tension's rising, that more and more conflict's happening with Jesus, and people are getting frustrated that Jesus doesn't seem to be setting the stage to do what they expect. <clears throat> the healing of the man on the Sabbath, dramatic event, this takes place now after that. They're still in the temple, and Jesus is still in Jerusalem, and he's teaching. John 10, 11 through 13, there's a verse up here. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. And, and so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. Jesus grabs Ezekiel chapter 34 and the title of the good shepherd from the Ezekiel prophecies and says, behold, I'm the good shepherd. I'm here. The Jewish leaders and people knew that Ezekiel 34 is not a happy chapter for leaders. It's basically the Lord saying, all of you are terrible shepherds and I'm taking over. This is how you've treated my sheep. This is how they've suffered. This is what you haven't done. I'm going to, as the good shepherd and the, 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 the best shepherd, come in and show you how it's done. And I'm going to take the sheep from you, and I'm going to be their shepherd. Jesus standing up, right off the heels of healing the blind man, breaking the Sabbath, according to the Jewish leaders, now in the temple, saying, hey, I want everybody to know here, I'm the shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. That, that's a little bit of a, a little bit of a, <clears throat> when other shepherds are in the room, there's an insinuation that maybe there's some not so good shepherds going on in the group, right? <clears throat> so Jesus calls himself the good shepherd from Ezekiel 34. This was a particularly blessed and barbed title. And we're going to read a little bit of, out of Ezekiel just so you can get Jesus's heart. This part of the message is for those of you who feel like you're a beaten down, battered, suffering, unfed Sheep that's not been around good shepherds. This is the passage that is meant to encourage you. Jesus is saying, I want you to know that you need a shepherd. And you may have been with some very poor shepherds. Some that may be bad. Uh, there's, there's a photo. Here's a good shepherd. Love this photo. He's, 
This is a bad shepherd. Maybe this is your feeling of being shepherded in your life. It's dark. It's been dreary. It's been hard. Haven't been well fed. You're probably wounded. You're probably in need of the other picture we saw. But you feel like you've been in this dark place. Jesus breaks in the scene, dramatically does it by healing the blind man who's in complete darkness. And shows that he's a good shepherd by what? Taking a broken sheep that can't see it's where it's going, can't live on its own, is completely dependent on anybody that would take care of it, and delivers that poor sheep from his blindness, and then, when the shepherds kick him out of the synagogue and the temple, finds that sheep and tells him, I'm your shepherd, I'm your Messiah, and shows that he is a good shepherd. Now he stands before the leaders, and he shows them and tells them, what has just happened is a reflection of the prophecies of Ezekiel fulfilled in me, the good shepherd. Those prophecies, Ezekiel chapter 34, 1 through 6, says this. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you shepherds of Israel who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourself with the wool, slaughter the choicest animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, or healed the sick, or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays, or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally, so there's scattered because there's no shepherd. And when they were scattered, then they became food for all the wild animals. And my sheep wandered over the mountains and on every high hill, and they were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. Do you hear the heart of God in there? Beautifully attentive to your needs. And where you're at, if you feel that your life reflects this kind of terrible care. He goes on to say in 34, 11 through 12, 14 through 16, for this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they're scattered on a cloudy day of darkness. And I will tend them in a good pasture. And the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land and they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the Lord. And I will search for the lost, and I will bring back the strays, and I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. But the sleek and the strong I will destroy, and I will shepherd the flock with justice. Jesus stands up in the temple, in Solomon's colonnade, and says, I am the good shepherd. What a profound, hopeful, thank God he's come. Advent cry from the Lord Jesus in that moment. John 10, 22 through 25 says, It was now winter, and Jesus was in Jerusalem at the feast or the time of Hanukkah, which is the festival of dedication. He was in the temple, walking through the section known as Solomon's Colonnade. I'm going to show you a short video that explains some things in this verse. We just ended, the Jewish people just ended Hanukkah this, this week, yesterday, I believe. Yes, yesterday. Um, this, this explains that feast, that's, that, that whole event, and gives you a little insight why Jesus was there celebrating Hanukkah. So, G so Jesus was there celebrating that festival. It's not in the Bible, but it's a part of the Jewish people's cultural traditions and celebrations, one of the most now. 
It's not uh, hard to see why the church in its similar celebrations is lighting candles right now in Advent. Because ultimately we believe that Jesus not only celebrated, he fulfilled Hanukkah. And this is, this is Jesus, the light of the world, which John lets us know again. But John chapter 10 takes a strange turn because something happens here that nobody that was familiar with Jewish history um, expressed in this video under the Slukids, uh Antiochus, his invasion, wasn't aware of that the temple only 150 years prior had been completely desecrated with its idol of Zeus built upon the tabernacle's altar, a blood, the blood of pigs slaughtered and desecrated it, the treasures of the temple uh, taken out, the people forbidden by law to read the Torah, all the scrolls that could be found were gathered up by this leader and burned. If anyone was found reading it, they were killed. Anyone who tried to circumcise their children, any woman, was crucified with her child hung around her neck. Not only did the Seleucid emperor, Antiochus IV, do these atrocious things and murdered up to 80,000, I think, more in his, in his ransacking Jerusalem after a defeat in uh, Alexandria. And as he's returning home, he took it out on the Jewish people. Lots of politics. I'll post some videos if you're interested in why. Not only did that, but he had a title and he minted his coins with this. And it was a title that said Antiochus Epiphanes which means, ultimately, God manifest. <clears throat> he was the ruler who stood up in this temple, slaughtering pigs and commanding by law that all Jewish people drop their religious laws and embrace the Hellenist nation, the Greek uh, rule and philosophy and gods by erecting that Zeus temple, which he thought he was somehow a byproduct of Zeus himself. So a foreign ruler saying that I am God manifested in your temple was not too far off the memory of the Jewish people, particularly the Pharisees who became a group of people in that time period that advocated for people like Judas Maccabees to rise up and throw off of all the paganization of the Greeks and to bring God's people back to faithfulness to Torah and to worship Yahweh or, yeah, and, and other things. So the Pharisees actually became a, a pretty radical movement that were pushing against the politically aligned group of people that were constantly blending Judaism or the faith of, of God's people with the political empires of the time. And what happened with, Judea, uh, with the Jewish people is there was this constant, and we know from the history of reading the story, right? God's people are coming out. All of a sudden Egypt takes over. Egypt puts them into slavery. God gives them a deliverer. They come out. They're unfaithful to God. What happens then? They're, they're dominated by the Babylonians. And then the Babylonians rule over them. Then some of them are faithful. People like Daniel and others rise up. And then another kingdom comes in. The Medes and the Persians come in. And then... Uh, the next group is just the Persians and, and, and they're in control and they begin to rebuild the temple. The temple that Jesus is going into right now is rebuilt under the Persians, under Xerxes and all the history there. At that time period, the Greeks and the rise of Alexander the Great was happening and there was the great battles between the Greeks and the Persians. That's where you get your 300 and that kind of stuff happening, marathon and all that stuff. That eventually Alexander the Great 
as prophesied by Daniel in chapter 9, you can go home and read it, and how hundreds, of, you know, 100 plus years prior to it ever happening, Daniel has a vision about Alexander the Great coming into the Roman, or the, the area at that time, taking over the whole world, conquering the Persians, and then he dies, and his kingdom, according to Daniel, is broken up into four pieces. And this is where you get the goat with the four horns. I think I have a picture of the goat with the four horns there. He gets a picture of the four-horned goat, which is Alexander's kingdom broken up. One of those horns in Daniel's vision in Daniel chapter 9 gets larger than the other one, and that one's Antiochus IV. And Daniel prophesies what he will do. Stop the sacrifices in Jerusalem, kill God's people, prevent them from reading the Torah, and just lists all the things in prophecy in, Jan in Daniel chapter 9, what would happen 150 years before Jesus shows up. Most of the modern scholars don't believe that Daniel actually was written by Daniel because if it was written by Daniel, then he prophesied all these historical events that came true. So they come up with all these other reasons why we can't trust Daniel as being an authentic book because the book isn't divinely inspired and it can't tell the future. But you know what? Daniel was inspired. He did prophesy that Alexander would come, that Antiochus would come, that all these events would come in Daniel chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11. Go back and read them. It's amazing prophecies. All of that built up to God's people in the tavern or in the temple, particularly the Pharisees, getting a little knee jerk when Jesus starts saying things like. This temple's going to be destroyed, and I'm going to raise it up in three days. You're talking about destroying the temple? On light of everything that we've been through as a people, it's finally been restored. It's finally been, like on Hanukkah, dedicated. And, and we're, dedicate, we're celebrating the dedication of it being cleansed from the pagan influence of our enemies and now you're talking about it being destroyed. You can see why Pharisees would get pretty riled up about Jesus' preaching. Now, if you read through the Gospels, you'll find something that Jesus did. He went to all kinds of churches, the then synagogues, and preached. He's getting everywhere, teaching people, and the leaders are getting nervous. Because he's not talking in a way that establishes them in power and holds to their vision of what God should be doing and is going to do hopefully in the future, which is bring us a king who's going to succeed where Judas Maccabee failed and he's going to defeat our enemies and he's going to defeat Rome and the temple's going to be the light of the world to the whole place. That's the Messiah we're looking for. He's supposed to do miracles and he's supposed to do all these things and you're doing them, but you don't sound like the Messiah. And not only that, you are undermining the shepherds of Israel and telling us that we're not leading the people correctly. Now this is important, folks, and we need to get this deep into our Christian understanding. When you have a vision that you as a people are going to conquer everyone and that everyone's going to submit to your religious view of how the world should be, you will be looking for leaders that will be powerful, that will be strong, that will take over, that will make everybody be the kind of person you want them to be. And this is exactly what happened with Judas Maccabee. Not only did he deliver the people from the, the foreign pagans, which did terrible things, you know what else he did? He went throughout Israel killing anyone who was too Greek, too Greekish. Too worldly, too compromising, too much aligned to the politics of that day. He just said, you're either with us or you're dead. And there was civil war in Israel because of this religious zealotry that was bent on cleansing the temple. Jesus comes on the scene and he starts telling people the complete opposite of that kind of ideology, which is you're going to love your neighbors. You're not going to sort them down. We're not going to defeat Rome by rising up and killing Rome. 
We're not going to take over. We're not going to rule and reign and bring everybody under subjection to our sword. And the Jewish people who were aligned with that messianic vision wanted nothing to do with Jesus' message. They wanted to silence him. So much so were they concerned that he was preaching a kingly kind of message. The ones that were already aligned with Rome, the Sadducees and some of the Pharisees, people that were gaining political power, they were nervous that Rome was going to think Jesus was another usurper and come in and take away all the peace that had somewhat been established and maybe do something that this, the, the Antiochus did before. Imagine if your whole people had been slaughtered, your women had been crucified, your temple had been desecrated by Zeus, and then the pagan ruling power is, is over your whole land and there's a ruler, or there's a, a messiah, a prophet rising up saying, we need the kingdom of God and I'm a king. You become nervous that maybe all those horrors are going to come back and wipe everything out again. What do you have to do? You have to kill that man. You have to align with Caesar and say, listen, he's not our king. What he envisions is not us. You, you need to be concerned about him and take him out. And that's exactly what we know John will eventually lead us to. But I want you to see that when Jesus was standing in the temple on Hanukkah, after healing a man on the Sabbath, and then in the midst of this, he preaches what he's about to preach, you have to put yourself in the minds of the people that heard him. That's all the history that a lot of you keep. Some people say, you know, why are you talking about the Jews and this, because Jesus was a Jew. The history of the gospel grew up out of all of these events. I started this message by saying Jesus can bring you to a good pasture. He can heal your boo-boos. He can feed you yummies. He can protect you from bad things. That's all true. But Jesus also was a prophet. He was a prophet. And he was the Messiah that had a message. And his message, if you read the gospels, was also terrifying because he prophesied that the Romans were going to destroy Jerusalem and the temple. Now imagine hearing that as a Pharisee, as a rabbi, as a good Jewish person. It's not a message you want to hear. Look at John um, 22, 20, or 20, uh, 24 through 25. <clears throat> the people surrounded Jesus and asked, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. They were thinking, the next picture, Judas Maccabees. Do I have that in there? Yeah. They were, they were asking Jesus, are you another Judas Maccabee? Are you going to be a Messiah figure? Are you going to defeat our enemies? Are you going to cleanse us from this pagan power that's over us? Are all, all of our hopes for the Messiah going to be in you? And what does Jesus say? He says, I have already told you, and you don't believe me. The proof is the work I do in my Father's name. And then he probably stood up, Mr. Blind Guy. Right? Because I'm sure that guy was real close to Jesus at this time. He's like, I have proven that I'm Messiah. I'm the only one who's opened the eyes of the blind. I've fulfilled all the prophecies. I've clearly showed you that I'm God's powers upon me. This man can see, and you still don't believe that I am the Messiah. John 10, 26 to 33, he continues. You don't believe in me because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow them. Follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. Little blind guys right under his arms. Right? No one. It doesn't matter if they kick you out of the synagogue or the temple. I got my arms around you. He says, for my father has given them to me and he is more powerful than anyone else. Now listen to this. No one can snatch them from my father's hand. The Jewish people are going, okay, okay. And then he says, the father and I are one. 
Okay. Verse 31, once again, the people picked up stones to kill him. Jesus said, at my father's direction, I have done many good works. For which one are you going to stone me? They replied, we are stoning you not for any good work, but for blasphemy. You are a mere man claiming to be God. Antichius, the fourth, God manifest in the temple. Jesus, the Son of God, standing up saying, I and the Father are one. Set everybody off. And the leaders grab stones. You might wonder where you're getting stones in a nice temple. If you are so lucky to have a, a Bible that is prior to the Reformation, you have 1 Maccabees in that Bible. And in chapter 4, verse 43 through 61, it says this. They, the Maccabees, purified the temple, and they took the stones that had been defiled by Zeus's idol on top of the, the altar that had been built by God, right? The temple altar defiled by Zeus on top of it, built on top of it. They took those stones that were defiled and put them in an unclean place. And they discussed what should be done with the altar of burnt offerings, which had been desecrated, the stones desecrated by the Gentiles. And they decided to tear it down so that it would not stand there as a monument to their shame. So they tore down the altar and put the stones in a suitable place on the temple hill where they were to be kept until a prophet should appear and decide what to do with them. I don't know if they grabbed these stones, but according to the Maccabees, there was some of these stones somewhere on the Temple Mount. And at this moment, the people that were in charge decided, this guy's a blasphemer, and there's only one thing we do with his type, we kill them. That's fascinating to me. Do you see why Jesus was so provocative? Why didn't he just make everything clear and simple and easy for everybody? Why didn't he talk them down better? Why did he say things that were so explosive? Why, knowing the whole history of the place, knowing what Hanukkah is about, knowing what everybody's celebrating on that day, how dare Jesus stand up and say, I and the Father are one, I'm God manifest. <laughs> My mind is blown by Jesus when I read the scriptures as they are unvarnished. Anybody else surprised by that? How else would he have been killed by his own people? It's not been safe. This is the problem. Jesus is building a kingdom that doesn't look like Judas Maccabees' kingdom. Jesus is a king. He is one who's bringing his kingdom to earth, but he said the kingdom of God is within you. Amen. Your heart now is the cleansed temple of God. Right. You, Paul says to the Romans, honor Christ as Lord in your heart. There is no temple to honor him in, but the temple of his gathered people and their spirit. And this kingdom that is coming is not like the kingdoms of this world. And whenever God's people in history have started to think that the way to bring about God's kingdom is to get in bed with the Romans, the Persians, the Medo-Persians, the Babylonians, the Egyptians. Trouble comes. Jesus spent most of his time nowhere near Jerusalem, but in Galilee, talking to fishermen and average people and teaching in the synagogue. He was building a kingdom that was going to be from the ground up. 
He wasn't of the establishment. He wasn't from Jerusalem. He wasn't trained by any of the people. He wasn't a part of, part of the priesthood. wasn't part of the Sanhedrin. He was doing something that was completely out in the wild, out in the farmland, in and among those who were least likely to be chosen, and began to preach a message that God was doing something for the whole world. He spent a good amount of his ministry right on the borderland of Galilee and Samaria. He went into Samaria. He he healed and delivered Samaritans. He healed and delivered Gentiles. He called people of God to repentance and to be born again and to cleanse the inside of their lives. He wasn't rebuilding a physical temple. He was rebuilding, he was building a spiritual temple that he said in you know, 40, 60, 80 days is going to come from heaven and fill the temple. He was building a temple, but it was a spiritual temple. It was a spiritual people whom he would be king over. And that gospel sprung out of Jerusalem beyond all the bounds of ethnic Judaism into the then Greco-Roman world that had one language thanks to Alexander, Koine, Koine Greek, that everybody understood. The Bible had been translated into Greek by the, the Septuagint, by the good Hebrews. All the pieces were in play. Roads were over the whole known world thanks to Roman architecture and engineering. The gospel spread all over the place because God appointed at this time for Christ to come. But he didn't come to establish his kingdom in Jerusalem and bring everybody under the sword and destroy Rome. He decided to convert people and transform them from the inside out. And that conversion was so strong. That mighty revival was so strong. It traveled all the way up to the emperor's own um, <laughs> house and, and staff and began to convert the people around the emperor. <clears throat> and eventually in the 4th century toppled the emperor Constantine in faith as well. But you know what happens after that? I just want to throw this in because i got a lot of time. i got 15 more minutes and you're stuck here. <laughs> uh, you guys can go longer in worship. <clears throat> you know what's interesting to note? That after the church explodes through Acts and goes into the world and the gospel's springing up everywhere. Churches are growing up in people's houses. Elders are being made and from doctors and bakers and all kinds of candlestick makers. And, and the church is going all over. All of a sudden, a, a vision starts happening within the people of God. We're going to organize more. We're going to start looking like the Greco-Roman world. And structure and hierarchies started growing. And titles and positions and power started growing. And soon Christendom was born. And the vision that maybe Christ is going to conquer the nations and we will be in power. And so a vision took over that soon the church <laughs> dangerous. This is dangerous talk. Maybe the church can ascend the seven, seven hills of Rome and be its power, be a powerful tool for God to use in rule over the whole world. Then divisions happen. The West and the East church split. The bishops and the cardinals argued over who was equal and who was greater and a pope emerges and the church begins this long journey of blending itself with political power in countries and soon the the landscape you move through through the you know the early church father era into the thousands into the medieval era and soon you have kings and priests in the same saddle, exercising governmental rule and religious rule by the sword. And what happens in the 1500s? A great shaking comes where some leaders and people rise up saying, 
You don't need to be under one man. You don't have to have a vision to conquer the world. God actually wants to know you in your heart. He wants you to have the scriptures to read for yourself. And the Reformation broke loose in the then known world and shattered all these power structures and put the word of God back into people's hands, spread the gospel. The gospel then exploded in missions across the world and a fire broke out. A fire that cleansed the church and also reordered the church under Christ in many good ways. <clears throat> but even those folks got tempted by the same vision to get with a king. And soon you had Protestants killing Catholics. Catholics were killing Protestants. Catholics and Protestants were killing Anabaptists. God's people were again trying to find a Saxony, a ruler, someone to protect them, and then to fight their enemies. And then a seed was born out of frustration with a church that was too melded with the state, and some pilgrims and some people said, let's go to a new land where we can just worship God, and no king's going to tell us what we're supposed to do. And our country was born with a vision to not do what everybody has been doing since the very dawn of time, which is get in bed with political power and try to make everyone serve you and then end up killing each other. And so our little pilgrims came with their funny hats and came across, my ancestors were on the Mayflower with this little crazy vision that maybe we could just like have the state be state and we'll just be us and we can grow a country and not do what everybody else has done. And guess what has happened? <laughs> Here we are in 2023. And the loudest message is, whose political party, who's got the sword, who's got the cross, who's going to make everybody bow to their values and visions of things? And the church is just pulled here and there between the two. Jesus did not come to set that up. Amen. And that's why he was crucified. Right. And God help us if we allow that vision to get into our blood and start trying to make people obey the word of God and the Lord himself in the same spirit. You know what comes out of that? Soon you are putting people in jail that don't, you don't agree with. You're burning people at the stake. You're, you're putting people in prison. You are persecuting them. And you know what? That's happening on both sides right now in our political landscape. I appeal to you to catch the vision of who Jesus is, who undermined dangerously that whole vision of a worldwide empire with rulers that will tell everybody what to do. Daniel prophesied that in the end, go read chapter 11 of Daniel, that another Antiochus IV type figure will come. And he will do all the same things, Daniel said, like this little horn did. And you know what we have? The book of Revelation that shows everything that Daniel said was going to happen, how it happens, but with Christ as a part of that vision. And you know what we see? We see a character come into play through the teaching of the apostles and primarily the book of Revelation that starts saying there is a anti-Christ who will come. And what will he do? Unite everybody, cause everybody to be happy together, Cause everybody to worship the way he wants. Persecute those people who don't. And on and on it just plays out again. Don't fall for the Kool-Aid. Yes. Don't fall for the Kool-Aid. Even if the Kool-Aid's red and in the red hands. Or if the Kool-Aid's blue and it's in the blue hands. Or if the Kool-Aid's purple and it's in the purple hands. Jesus doesn't serve Kool-Aid. He serves living water. And it's different. And you can be tempted. You can be tempted to want a Judas Maccabus. You can be tempted to want an Antichrist. I've heard 
Young men say, just give me a Darth Vader who will take over the world and make it do the right things. That's exactly what Don, that Daniel had a vision of. That there would come a ruler who will just say, you know what, everyone's going to bow to me and I am in power and I'm going to settle everything and I've had enough strength to make everybody do the thing I want. And at one sense, it makes you feel good, right? We want the bad people punished. We want the power to bring it all together. We want to be liberated. And Jesus said, that way leads to death. And he's, he did it radically by saying, in fact, I just want you to know this. All these stones and temples and priesthood and everything in a few decades, in your generation, it's all going to be destroyed. Everything you're hoping for, everything that you think your hopes are built on, Jesus said, it's all going to burn. He says, God help you if you're pregnant in that time. If you're a nursing mother, you're going to have to flee. There's no hope in a vision for a Rome that's going to rule the world. Yeah. That, in my estimation, and I know I could split this room into 17 different ways by saying it. That, in my estimation, is the gospel of Jesus. <sighs> he is bringing a kingdom. And at his second coming... He will stand on the earth and make everything right. And he will bring everyone into obedience to his lordship. Until then, folks, we are exiles. We are foreigners. We are sheep led to the slaughter until he returns. Let's pray. Jesus, John wrote these striking words in the midst of a festival that had so much hope. And we long for hope, Jesus. Yes. We want peace. We want righteousness to prevail. We want darkness to be defeated. We want sin to be put to an end. We want joy and life and light. This Christmas season, may we see, Jesus, that you give that. You are the answer yourself to all the human longings in those words. Lord, let us not lose you because you're in the nativity. And we're looking for you in a palace. Or we're looking for you in the White House. Or we're looking for you in the UN or the EU. Jesus, reveal yourself to us among the blind, among the sick, among the broken, and among the hungry. And may we give ourselves to the Lord who came and suffered and died, thereby conquering evil. Give us a vision of the gospel and the kingdom of God afresh in this Christmas season. And Lord, we repent where maybe we have been caught up in the visions of a Messiah that isn't meeting our expectations. And maybe we've been given a different Jesus. Maybe a different gospel. Maybe we just need our eyes baptized. We need healing in our eyes, Jesus. And the eyes of our heart. I want to follow you, Jesus. And you died outside Jerusalem. On a hill. Overlooking a city that missed its day of visitation. God, we long for you to return. And set all things right. And if anyone in this room has bowed its knee to a vision of the Messiah that needs to be repented of, I pray you do. And that the Prince of Peace would rule and reign in your heart. If you're suffering under bad shepherds, be healed. Come to clean water, green pastures. Come to the place where Jesus will say, I don't need you, just lay down. I'm enough. If you're afraid of wolves and beasts,
peace in the field, Jesus is bigger. If you're broken and wounded, He can bound, bind you up and heal you. And if you're hungry and thirsty, He is your meat and drink. Come unto the Good Shepherd and let Him lead us, us the little flock, under the leadership of Jesus, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a good Sunday.